morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good, great. Good to see your smiling faces here. I'm Adriana Radulovic. I'm the Executive Secretary of GeoBond, and I will be your host this week. Welcome to Montreal. Soyez le bien, bienvenue à Montréal. Now, before we start, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. If you have cell phones, and I'm pretty sure all of you do have cell phones, please put them in silent mode. Also, identify the nearest exit that you can see. They are called sorties in French. You can see them here in the back. We will be a lot of people in this venue uh, throughout the week with a peak on Thursday when we are expecting more than 600 people here. So you need to know the emergency exits. And we count on all of you for a smooth event. Now, GEOBON, which stands for Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, for those of you who do not know, is a global network, a growing network of more than 2,800 members across 140 countries. A network of experts that are volunteering their time, their knowledge, their expertise to monitoring biodiversity change, to inform policy and decision making for biodiversity conservation. Our network is actually celebrating 15 years this year, 15 years of existence, 50 years, 15 years in which our experts have developed a set of essential biodiversity variables, essential ecosystem service variables, as well as, as a set of indicators to detect biodiversity change, and also they introduced the concept of biodiversity observation networks or bonds, and you will be hearing about bonds throughout the week. Many of you were in Montreal just 10 months ago when the world came together to negotiate a new and ambitious global biodiversity framework at COP15, the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. We now have this framework and we need to implement it through a whole of society approach. Therefore, GEOBON and CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, partner up to organize a conference on this exact topic, the GBF implementation, but through the lens of monitoring biodiversity for action. This conference hosted in this venue, which is a former UN building, that's why you can see the translator's booth up there. It used to be um, the headquarters of the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO. So this conference is meant to be a convening space for scientists, policymakers, NGOs, private sector, local communities, indigenous communities, citizen scientists, that are all coming here to share knowledge related to monitoring biodiversity from genes to ecosystems. Monitoring with a purpose though, and that is of informing better decisions to protect and use sustainably biodiversity. For the next few days, this space will be an agora for exchanges, debates, brainstorming, and hopefully new collaborations. Some of the brightest minds in biodiversity science and policy are in this room throughout the week. And since the weather is not very inviting for explorations outdoors, we count on you um, to have some explorations indoors. We have a lot of talks, a lot of posters, a lot of people that are just waiting to connect and learn from each other. Because transformative change does not come from the top. It needs to start with us. It needs to start with the bottom. So we are the real actors of transformative change. So on behalf of GeoBond and CBD, a warm welcome from cold Montreal. And thank you for being here. On est ravi de vous avoir parmi nous cette semaine. And now let's start the marathon because we are a bit late. And we are going to start with a focus on the land that we are on, that we call now Montreal, but that uh, belongs to ancestral um, people, the First Nations of, um, of the land that we call now Montreal. And we are very honored to have with us, starting this event, a highly respected elder from the um, 
from Ganawake, which is a community just across the river from here in the south. His name, Otsitsangora, translates to spotted flower, and he belongs to the bear clan. He has been deeply involved in both spiritual and civic affairs within his community for over 45 years, and is committed to ensuring the continuance of his tradition, language, spirituality, ceremony, and culture. He also holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Michigan. Most recently, he was involved with the COP15 for biodiversity and COP26 on climate uh, regarding concerns um, for the environmental future of the indigenous youth. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charles Patton or Otsitsang Kora. Negiona <laughs> One neki, what the sugini you ne rawni gumra, raw such tansra. Wahar is around there you got sarko, than the water, you know what stock are you, one hundred geek or gunra. Neki wain is at his tan, jetko gunke, jetko is already what when you stuck. Neki ali huni, neki way to knigo what the sugari one who does in the sugari sugaya disu. Jetko da, when I do, I do what the nora do hack. On an eki, a gay gona hot on a old nigura, a yagin in her, okay. You got nista, you keep nista. Gina hot, the agoda sirawa, jigahata gay, jigan quatra gay. The ganion in a hagir and a jiganagarunu, jiwahia gay. On an any original hot, I won't guess you not on hatches. Quatching your old and a jigaquira gay than the jigarunta gay. Nagi aqua good deer to no more duchess. Caragunson aguago di dacano gestures, good deal, nanny only deer to no more ado. Tano I got to go to Enagonaguara di Genuges or Gito Kuma. Tani over the Gayeri Nicawarake. To no good deer to Roku yet is to go at the wearers. You keep Nigo Harajes to Saki a good catch con a cajit no you honors. Quatching your order on an agony, dear aquara gay chido a cheer than you keep sota. Asatanka neka garaqua. Nagi aque gone, theatre no other duce, she segi a quadra sweer, she said to me, Quatinora on a dear disto quarunio. Tanane on a tahino ward and the sugay at this, eh, she was sugar in acta, say what the sugar the son of Sego, I did away, seke. Say, are you guenu? Ne, I do what the dihake, you go warna, segi way, and Jacotan or ad, on a giza carry one who do, ne. So in our in our ways, amongst our people, we say that at the beginning of the world, when the Creator made human beings. He took the living earth out of, out of the river bank and he molded a human being, a male and a female, and he gave us a mind, the same mind that you carry. He put his fire in our blood, the same fire that burns in your blood, and he breathed into our mouths three times. And he said to those two, he said, now he picked up the earth and he said, this is what I will tell you, the earth is your mother. You came from her, and she will nurture you and take care of you. And the only thing the Creator ever asked of us as human beings is that we walk in balance in the earth, walk together within the cycle of life, and give thanks for what we get, and acknowledge our lives. And so we, this is what we do always before we begin 
And so as one mind, now we turn our greetings and our mind to all of the things that the earth has. Our mother, the earth, every day she works for us, every season, every millennia. She never stops to care for us as human beings. And so we acknowledge her, even though in this day, what you're here to talk about by a diversity and the things that are hurting our mother, you understand that she's, she is suffering because of the, the work and the things that human beings have done in terms of money. And so we have to get back to looking at our mother as the one that we came from and we care for her. And our mother, she wears a most beautiful, beautiful dress, like the ribbon dress of a woman. And on that drove is, is woven all of the grass life, all the different kinds of grasses, the root life, all of the medicines that grow on the earth, all of the berry life that grows on that dress on her, on her back. And on, even to the, the strawberries, leader of all the berry plants that live on the earth, it's special to us, and even to the foods of life, the corn, the beans, and the squash. In our ceremony, we call them the three sisters, and they're the leaders of all foods that grow in this world. In, all, in our ceremony houses, every ceremony that we do from spring to now is all about food, because if there is no food, there is no life. And the food needs to hear us, and we need to give thanks for that. And the way our people do that is we dance and we sing and we acknowledge her. And then we look at the earth, all of the rivers and the waters on the earth, and we give thanks for them because without water, there is no life. But without balance in the water, life will suffer just as it is now when the rivers and the oceans are rising and things are going to change for us very soon. And so we have to acknowledge the waters and we always ask them to, not to harm us too much, but now to help us to listen to the message that she gives us. To the animals and the fish and the bugs that live in water world, we give them our greetings and our thank you for all the things that they do. They work in balance with our mother. And finally, to the trees, the smallest trees, to all the way to the great, to the great maple tree, the one we drink our sap and we boil it and we make maple sugar. That's what we use to feed our peoples. And so we acknowledge all things of the earth at this time. We turn to the sky and we see the birds fly above our heads, all the different kinds of birds. And we give thanks to them, to the great eagle, the eyes of the creator and he watches over us from way up in the sky. We acknowledge the bird life at this time. We, look, we turn to the winds, the four winds that come from all directions and that change constantly the earth and to come with the cold wind to take away the sickness that gathers in one spot on the earth. And we thank the grandfather thunder beings that watch over us and they have a responsibility to always uh, drive the spirits of the great dinosaurs from ever rising. And they said if they ever should rise, their breath, their power would burn our skin and burn the skin of our mother. And that's why you're here when you talk of biodiversity. Now we dig human beings into the earth and we suck out the blood of those dinosaurs and we boil it up and we put it in our cars. And sure enough, the breath of the dinosaur is burning our skin. We call it global warming. We call it acid rain. It burns our breath. We call it asthma in a smog. So we see the effects of those dinosaurs still today. We turn our words now to the two sons, the older brother, the son, and we acknowledge he works with men and he warms up the earth and gives power to the earth. We acknowledge him because he never pulls back his power. Every day the sun will shine. What a great sorrow it would be if the sun stopped shining and we would see our children growing cold and shivering in the cold, cold daytime. And the grandmother moon, she works above our heads in the nighttime world and she works with women and the monthly cycle of female life. And without that cycle functioning every month, no more children would be conceived or born. 
So we acknowledge her at this time. We turn now to what we call the stars and we give them our greetings. And we acknowledge the beautiful dress of lights that the sky world wears. And we ask those stars always to watch over us, to light the way in front of us. So we give them our greetings. And finally to the creator, we thank the creator for allowing us another day to live. It says every day that we open our eyes and we take another breath. The creator has allowed us another day to live. And the responsibility of that day we live is to take care of our mother, the original instructions. And so these are the words that we have to offer. And I apologize because I only have 10 minutes to speak. If amongst our people, we would take hours because we acknowledge all the things that our mother gives us. But it is enough for this time. Maybe at another time we could sit and we could talk for those hours and we understand our relationship with the earth. So thank you so much and we open your gathering. And now you understand this relationship we have with the earth. Use it as you walk in everything you do. Remember, this earth is your mother, not something you buy and sell, but care for her and she will care for you. So I thank you so much for listening. Now I want you to ask what Thank you so much for reminding us why we are here and reminding us of all the beauty and, and value of nature. Next, we have Mark Diorio, Assistant Deputy Minister of the Science and Technology Branch at Environment and Climate Change Canada, which is the, the Canadian Ministry of the Environment. The branch is Canada's leader in environmental science, including atmospheric and climate modeling aquatic ecosystems, and long-term water quality monitoring, wildlife and landscape science, and chemical risk assessment. Um, science advice generated by the branch informs policy, regulations, and operations. Mr. Diorio began his career in government as a postdoctoral fellow in climate change. He has worked in a number of positions as a scientist, a manager, and a leader of organizations that conduct research, fund science, or use science to make policy and regulatory decisions. Uh, Mark Diorio is also Canada's focal point on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and Canada's permanent representative to the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Mr. Diorio played a pivotal role in leading electrification and decarbonization of transport sectoral tables across government in the development of the enhanced climate plan that Canada has. Mr. Diorio, the floor is yours. Bonjour à tous, bienvenue à Montréal. Il me fait plaisir de vous transmettre aussi la bienvenue de notre ministre, uh, Stephen Guibault. He wishes you a very productive conference. Uh, he could not be here today, but indicated how he values the work of Geobon and its role in informing decisions on biodiversity. I'd like to start off by thanking our elder for reminding us of our relationship with the Earth reminding us of how we need to value nature and take a balanced approach to things. It is really uh, essential that as we consider biodiversity, whether it's Geobon or the Convention on Biodiversity, that we realize that indigenous people are the first impacted and have this traditional knowledge about nature that we must consider and work with indigenous people across the world as partners. In Canada, all the lands that we live on, work on, play on, are traditional, ancestral, unceded territories of indigenous Inuit and Métis people. And we are very grateful to be able to work and live here. 
so indeed it was uh, just 10 months ago, about 10 blocks away from here, that the world did come together for the Convention on Biodiversity and agreed to the Kooning Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. It's a very comprehensive framework, very ambitious, but with real targets and real indicators associated with it. And I'm very pleased to see that Geobon is working with uh, the CBD in order to inform decisions. And Juvon can play a critical role around the world in informing policy leaders, uh, informing regulators on the state of the planet. Juvon has done exceptional work with respect to setting up these uh, biological observation network and really looking at essential biological uh, variables. We must use that work in order to look at our policies and look at how we're progressing towards the targets that we have set for ourselves. And they're not just targets, not just aspirational. We must accomplish, we must meet these targets, the life of our planet, our own livelihood depends on it. I think sometimes that biodiversity is one of these terms that to the general public, there's a certain knowledge of it, but the real implication of biodiversity, of ecosystem services is not fully appreciated. And I think collectively it is our work to be really educating people broadly about why it is that important and why we must truly make progress on this. And within Canada, we are developing a national biodiversity strategy in order to implement the global biodiversity framework, and this strategy should be released later this year. We have also worked on a national Earth observation strategy um, so that Earth observation information can be available Canada, uh, some of you may know, was actually the third nation in space after the Soviet Union and the United States launching a communication satellite, so basically 60 years ago now. And as such, Canada has needs as a very large, extended nation to be able to be uh, leaders in communication, first to reach all communities, but in Earth observation as well, so that we understand fully what happens to our planet and to our country, and to do so in the context of the changing climate, changing climate that we see, uh, where we see very broad impacts this year that has affected many. So in this meeting over the coming days, I do wish you some very fruitful and dynamic discussion. I think you all play a critical role, and I would personally want to thank you for the work that you do on uh, Geobon, and I can say that uh, we're quite honored to have the uh, Jubon Secretariat to be housed in Montreal at McGill University. So I wish you a great few days of discussion and look forward to talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Diorio. As some of you might know, Geobon has a secretariat uh, you've just heard. It is based at McGill in Montreal, and it also has two co-chairs that you will meet a bit later. One is in Montreal, and one is in Bogota, in Colombia. Therefore, we are very happy to have here with us His Excellency Carlos Arturo Morales, Ambassador of the Republic of Colombia to Canada, who will be giving a few remarks now. Your Excellency, please. Bonjour à tous. Good morning. Buenos dias. Mr. Charles Patton, Odi Sangora, Honorable Mark Delorio, Assistant Deputy Minister for, Enviro for Environment and Climate Change of Canada, Madame Marie André Majou, Mairesse de District de Verdun, Dr. David Cooper, Acting Executive Secretary of the Convention of Biodiversity Secretariat. Ambassador Luis Estela Jara, Consul General of Colombia in Montreal, Dr. Adriana Radulovic, Executive Secretary of the Geobon, Dr. Andrew Gonzalez, and Dr. Maria Cecilia Londoño, co chairs of the Geobon Conference. Distinguished guests, honorable government officials, friends, all. 
It is a great honor and privilege to speak to you today on the occasion of the Global Environment Networks Biodiversity Observation Network Conference. Almost one year after the 15 meeting of the Conference of the Paris of the Convention on Biodiversity that took place here in Montreal, we have the opportunity to gather again, highlighting the importance to develop best practices and implement technologies to collect information and design policy and actions towards conservation of biodiversity. The scientific community has a very decisive role to guide the actions and monitoring, and monitoring of policies, such as this conference, where we bring the academic community to meet a need from the parties to the agreement in the monitoring of the coming global biodiversity framework. This is especially important for Colombia, a country diverse and rich in many ways, a country of beauty where all this diversity of life needs to be protected and where we are committed to do it. Colombia is one of the most biodiverse countries per square kilometer in the planet and is committed to protecting nature and ecosystem services as a cornerstone of sustainability. We are one of the first in a species of birds, orchids, plants, amphibians, butterflies, freshwaters, fish, palms, reptiles, and mammals. We are even home to more than 5,000 endemic species. We are, on the, we are one of those 17 countries home to 70% of the species of our planet. But our diversity does not stop there. We have, we have uh, like Canada, a rich and diverse cultural heritage with more than 100 indigenous groups and 68 languages. We are also blessed with a variety of ecosystems from the Amazon rainforest to the Andean mountains, from the Caribbean coast to the Pacific Ocean. We are the country of beauty. But we are also aware of the threats and challenges that biodiversity faces in the 21st century. Climate change, deforestation, pollution, overexploitation, invasive species, and illegal wildfire trade are some of the factors that put our natural wealth and the natural wealth of the globe at risk. The global phenomenon of biodiversity loss is endangering not only our existence, but, but also species to the future of our planet. Human activities have led to the threat of extinction for approximately one million species. According to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform, on the biodiversity and ecosystem services. This loss of biodiversity has significant implications for various aspects of human life and well-being, including development, economics, security, and society. We need to engage in global action to advance towards a profound shift in production and consumption patterns so we can transition to a sustainable path of development in time to avert impending crisis. We understand the challenge. This is the reason why Colombia have been active in participating in the meetings of the Conference of the Paris of the Convention on Biodiversity. Last year, we actively took part in negotiations towards the coming Montreal Framework for Biodiversity to 2030. The framework acknowledges that biodiversity is fundamental to human beings, a healthy planet, and economic prosperity for all people, including for living well in balance in harmony with Mother Earth. We depend on it for food, medicine, energy, clean air and water, security from natural disasters, as well as recreation and cultural inspiration, and it supports all systems of life on Earth. This framework, sets ambitious and realistic goals and targets for the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of biodiversity at all levels. It will be a fundamental tool in advancing to reach the sustainable development goals. It is indeed a tool for the shift that we need to make in our consumption patterns and the importance of the use of the resources in harmony with nature to sustain life in our planet. 
The framework gives a main place to biodiversity into all sectors of society through ensuring the participation of all stakeholders, including indigenous peoples and local communities as custodians of biodiversity and patterns in the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of it. For Colombia, as a mega diverse country, it is fundamental importance to incorporate the coming Montreal Global Framework for Biodiversity in an inclusive, fair, and equitable manner into the economic dynamics of the region and in the planet. As per the construction of information systems with national and local base, Colombia, as well as Canada, is working to strengthen the governance of territories, of indigenous peoples, and local communities through more and better, and better access to information. Escazú Agreement, for example, so matters such as indicators and monitoring is not only a matter of reporting countries to the Convention of Biodiversity, but a matter of generating knowledge to improve governance processes that allow the conservation of biodiversity. We believe that biodiversity is not only a source of environmental benefits, but also a driver of social and economic development. Biodiversity can provide solutions to some of the most pressing challenges that humanity faces today, such as food security, health poverty, reduction, climate change, adaptation and mitigation, and peace building. The framework sends a strong signals about the need for accessible means of implementation for the parties, emphasizing financing from all available sources and the integration of public policy legal frameworks, planning and budgeting processes. Colombia pushes to move in this direction to close the existing finance and ga financing gaps in attempt to promote coordinated and coherent actions that promote good practices. Indeed, with this objective, last year during the session of the COP15 in December 2022, here in Montreal, Colombia, with the financial support of Germany, led the launch of the Initiative on National Strategies and Action Plans of Biodiversity, Accelerator Partnership. Colombia firmly believes that the tools we will, we will need to be aimed to achieve sustainable patterns of production and consumption, promote green growth by boosting the circular economy, the bioeconomy, and the forestry economy increase resources mobilization from all sources, reform or eliminate incentives with negative impacts on biodiversity, and develop positive incentives such as payments for environmental services. Position the concept of nature-based solutions, prevent loss of traditional knowledge, and promote the full and effective participation of communities, women, and youth. Finally, be this opportunity to reiterate the efforts in conservation that Colombia has been making, such as the initiative of the Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Conservation Corridor, where we aim for the sustainable use and proper management of biodiversity and marine and coastal resources in the Pacific coast of Ecuador, Costa Rica, Panama, and Colombia. Also, recently, our government is initiating the process to include the Colombian part of the Darien as a biosphere reserve recognized by UNESCO to add the efforts already made by Panama in protecting the part located in their territory. We hope that this opportunity keeps paving the way to collect information, precise and fundamental, to guide the action for designing and implementation of policy for conservation and to live in harmony with nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. And I would also like to acknowledge the presence in the room of the Consul General of the Republic of Colombia to Canada, Madame Luz de la Jara Portilla. Thank you for being here. Bon, après le Canada et la Colombie, notre périple nous amène à Montréal. On est heureux d'avoir parmi nous Madame Marie-André Manger, membre du comité exécutif de la ville de Montréal, 
responsable de la transition écologique et de l'environnement, MRS de l'arrondissement du Verdun. Madame Auger. Bonjour à vous toutes et tous. Euh, bonjour Monsieur Patten. Quelques salutations Monsieur Diorio, euh, Monsieur l'ambassadeur euh, Arturo Morales, Monsieur Cooper. Bonjour. Euh, bien sûr Madame euh, Madame euh, Radulovici. Merci. Um, Welcome to Montreal. Uh, it's a beautiful time of the year, although we feel now the fall arriving. Uh, it's getting cooler, but it's, you still can enjoy the beautiful color in Montreal. I hope you speak a little bit of French or uh, you, you can uh, understand a little bit of French because uh, most of my uh, opening remarks will be in French as we are in the French metropolis in North America. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, donc c'est vraiment un plaisir d'être ici pour cette cérémonie d'ouverture de la conférence Géobonne qui est euh, dans la continuité de la COP15 sur la biodiversité dont Montréal a été l'hôte en décembre dernier et qui a mené au cadre mondial euh, Kunming Montréal. Vous savez, à Montréal, on est dans l'action pour la protection de la biodiversité, autant les espèces que les écosystèmes et ça depuis plusieurs années déjà. On a euh, donc, euh, avec euh, Espace pour la vie, créé un fonds pour les espèces en péril, euh, notamment euh, euh, l'ail des bois, le chevalier euh, cuivré, on pense aussi à la rainette faux grillon euh, et quelques autres espèces. Et on travaille de pair avec donc, le milieu scientifique et, euh, et aussi donc, euh, on, cherche à, on se base sur la science pour établir les actions à venir et, euh, et aussi avoir des inventaires écologiques. Euh, vous l'avez peut-être vu, euh, ceux qui vivent à Montréal l'automne dernier, on a adopté le plan de protection euh, des pollinisateurs à Montréal parce que les villes sont euh, des lieux de prédilection pour créer des habitats pour les insectes, les papillons, les oiseaux, euh, notamment parce qu'il y a peu d'activités agricoles et peu d'utilisation des pesticides ou enfin on peut vraiment bannir les pesticides. C'est ce qu'on a fait à Montréal justement pour, euh, pour s'éloigner de la monoculture du gazon dans les pratiques horticoles et euh, favoriser justement le, les habitats pour les pollinisateurs. On est aussi euh, en train de mettre en œuvre notre plan Nature et Sport. Et à travers donc, le plan Nature et Sport, on a des programmes de gestion des écosystèmes et euh, on a des objectifs d'envergure, notamment euh, on veut protéger 10 du territoire, on veut planter, protéger et entretenir un demi-million d'arbres additionnels d'ici 2030, on veut réhabiliter 10 km de berges dans les grands parcs, et créer plusieurs grands parcs, notamment le Grand Parc de l'Est, le Grand Parc de l'Ouest et plusieurs autres parcs comme la Falaise Saint-Jacques, euh, le Parc de la Chine. So in Montreal, we are uh, under, we are aiming to protect 10% of the island of Montreal and plant more than half a million uh, trees, plant them and protect them. Uh, so half a million by 2030, and also we want to protect 10 kilometers of shore, uh, and also um, we want to create more uh, uh, big parks in Montreal to make sure that all the population have access to a uh, green space, uh, so that we create um, attachment to nature. Alors, tous ces plans, ces stratégies, ces actions sont inscrits dans les engagements de Montréal sur la plateforme internationale Cities with Nature. Montréal est une ville pionnière de cette initiative. Et vous savez, Montréal est l'hôte du secrétariat sur la diversité, la Convention sur la diversité biologique depuis plus de 25 ans. Et lors de la COP15, Montréal a co-organisé le septième sommet sur les gouvernements infranationaux et les villes. Les villes, quand on parle de biodiversité, sont très importantes. On dit qu'aujourd'hui, euh, 50 de la population mondiale vit dans les villes. 
Uh, in Canada and in Quebec, it's already 75% uh, or around 75% of people who lives in urban areas. Uh, worldwide, we say that around uh, 2050, 75% of people will live in urban areas. That's why at the city of Montreal, we recognize the role of the city and metropolis, and we take the leadership in showing uh, example and leading by example how we can uh, root nature in the city instead of opposing nature and cities like we've seen uh, through the past decades. Uh, le leadership de la mairesse Valérie Plante est très important à cet égard et uh, lors de la COP15, la mairesse a lancé l'engagement de Montréal. Uh, during the COP15 conference, uh, Mayor Valérie Plante in Montreal launched the Montreal Pledge. To this day, uh, almost 70, country, uh, 70 cities around the world have endorsed the Montreal Pledge and it's about 125 uh, million people. So if every city is put in action those five uh, concrete action for uh, protecting biodiversity, we could see a, a great impact. Uh, alors, c'est ça, l'engagement le, de Montréal, c'est 15 actions concrètes. Bien sûr, Montréal y est engagé. On parle euh, des pesticides, la lutte aux espèces exotiques envahissantes, de l'augmentation des espaces verts. Uh, donc, on le dit, les villes sont aux premières loges des changements climatiques, de la perte de biodiversité, et on est bien placé pour agir concrètement et rapidement pour freiner ce, ce déclin. Alors, je vous remercie de prendre le temps de, de participer à cette conférence, de votre engagement pour la biodiversité. Euh, je remercie aussi toute l'organisation euh, Géobande pour euh, leur engagement dans la biodiversité. Et euh, j'espère qu'à l'issue de votre rencontre vendredi, euh, vous serez euh, motivé pour aller encore plus loin et exercer une influence auprès de de la communauté scientifique, des décideurs et décideuses, pour qu'on euh, sente cette poussée euh, de, dans l'opinion publique en faveur de, de gestes pour protéger la biodiversité. So I wish you a good week and a good conference in Montreal. I hope you will uh, have a, a lot of motivation uh, and more, uh, more power to convince people of uh, the urgent emergency of uh, acting for uh, protection of biodiversity. Merci beaucoup, bonne conférence à vous. Merci beaucoup, Madame Mongé. We are very happy to be in Montreal. As you heard, Montreal has great plans um, to protect biodiversity, to increase biodiversity. I think we all know that urban development will just continue and we need to be careful on how we are growing this, these communities of the future. Now we have David Cooper, the Acting Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Dr. Cooper brings over 30 years of environmental and agricultural expertise. Um, he served as Deputy Executive Secretary since 2015. He led strategic planning and intergovernmental processes for the CBD and its protocols. He played a pivotal role in COP15, as some of us know, facilitating the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, its adoption and key decisions. Dr. Cooper's background spans roles at the FAO, Grain and United Nations Association, UK. He holds uh, a master's degree and a PhD degree from the University of Oxford. Mr. Cooper, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Adriana, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you all here. Um, my thanks to Elder Charlie Patton for, for your well, words of welcome to the traditional territories here, and also to thank you and the Ganawagi community for your ongoing strong support to the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, to our mission, uh, our vision of uh, living in harmony uh, with nature. And 
As you know, and as other speakers have mentioned, uh, last year the world uh, adopted the Kunming Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, which provides a roadmap for living in harmony with nature by, by 2050. Uh, it includes four goals to define that vision, protecting and conserving biodiversity and ecosystems, maintaining nature's contributions to people uh, and the benefits people uh, uh, get from nature, ensuring the fair and equitable um, sharing of benefits from genetic resources and, and digital sequence information, and of course, ensuring that we have adequate finance and means of implementation. Uh, and these goals and that vision is to be realized through a set of 23 uh, targets. Tracking progress to those targets, of course, is, is um, a, major, uh, a major challenge uh, and uh, one that this conference will, uh, I'm sure, provide some, um, some important insights. I'd like to also acknowledge and, and thank the leadership of um, Canada and Colombia, uh, among, among other, other countries, in, in uh, securing agreement on, on the framework and in the action uh, taken to uh, accelerate uh, implementation, to give um, momentum through the various initiatives um, that Canada and Colombia have, have championed. I'd also really like to acknowledge uh, the leadership of Montreal, thank you for welcoming us at COP15. Thank you for welcoming us back here uh, again now. Thanks also for the leadership of uh, Valerie Plant together with the province of Quebec uh, in championing the role of cities and subnational governments uh, in the uh, achievement of the Kunming Montreal framework. Adopting the framework last December, of course, was a big success, but that was the easy part. Now um, we have to uh, ensure its, its implementation. And, and now each country has the task of translating the goals and targets of the framework that was adopted last December into national uh, targets and integrating those into their updated national biodiversity strategies and action plans. And of course, then most importantly, putting in place the measures to, to implement them. Um, next year at COP16, um, countries are to report on where they are so far in that, uh, in that task. They are, by COP16, to have set their, their national targets. And we need to be able to see, do these targets um, add up to the, 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 the global targets, the global vision? Are they sufficient to achieve that mission of uh, halting and reversing the loss of biodiversity and putting us on a path to recovery? The framework, as you know, also in includes a monitoring framework with a set of indicators for tracking progress towards the goals and targets. And in fact, just uh, last week, also in Montreal, there was a meeting of the uh, ad hoc technical expert group uh, created by COP15 to um, further develop the, the indicator framework. But there's a lot more to do. And I'm, I'm really very excited that um, we have this uh, Geobond conference now taking place uh, in Montreal to look at how we can further strengthen um, biodiversity monitoring. Geobond has already achieved a lot. Over the last uh, decade, the Geobond has grown into the largest global network and community of practice of those involved in biodiversity observations. Uh, and many of you uh, in the room have been uh, involved in this. Um, Geobond's represented in the Biodiversity Indicators Partnership, uh, which was recognized for its role in monitoring the previous strategic plan of the CBD. Geobond has uh, championed the development of the essential uh, biodiversity variables, uh, now also the essential ecosystem variables, 
uh, and these have been uh, recognized uh, among, uh, by, among others by the, by the, by best, the um, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And of course, many uh, members of GEOBON played a major role in developing the, um, and advising uh, the negotiators in the development of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Adriana and Andy and Maria Cecilia, the, the co-chairs of GeoBond for their leadership, also uh, their, their predecessors and all of those that have been engaged in, in this important work. Now we have an opportunity to take this um, further fo forward. And of course, in doing so, there are a number of challenges that we have to face. Um, firstly, let us remember that the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, it's about biodiversity, yes, but it's about halting biodiversity loss, and that means addressing the drivers of biodiversity loss, direct and indirect, which means that we have to move beyond looking at only um, species, genes, and ecosystems. We have to look at all those factors of uh, our economies and our societies that are driving um, biodiversity loss. The framework is underpinned by a human rights-based approach, which, um, again, I think, uh, emphasizes the breadth of what uh, we are facing. And I think I'd like to just make one point here. We, of course, we often say that we can only manage what we can measure, and indeed we need to improve um, what we, uh, how we can measure uh, all of these important factors. But we must not uh, cast aside um, those things that may be more difficult uh, to measure. Um, we still must make the, the, the greatest attempt to look at the full um, span of, of the framework. Uh, I think also another point I'd like to uh, emphasize as we move forward is the importance of working with um, national governments and with the local level and, of course, with uh, indigenous peoples. Um, the ownership over the processes um, as we um, move forward is very important. I'm sure that we're going to... Um, all be very excited about the latest opportunities for remote sensing or for the use of AI or for other um, um, uh, advances. But let us also always make sure that we're wor working together with and closely with the communities and the, the, um, the governments and the bureaucracies that we have to, that have to be engaged in this, in this process. Um, I think I want to um, welcome the work that Geobond's been doing with the establishment of biodiversity observation networks and emphasize the importance of um, all uh, the actors being engaged in that. Thirdly, um, to truly work with indigenous peoples in, in, in the use of uh, traditional knowledge, community monitoring. Uh, we've been saying this for a long time, that we need not only uh, conventional science, but also traditional knowledge. I think in the last few years, we've seen these things coming together much more uh, and a, a much greater common sense of purpose in, in working together. This was, I think, um, very clear at COP15 uh, here in Montreal. Um, the IPBES uh, process has certainly helped as well. Um, we know um, that if we look around the world, the areas uh, that are in best shape for biodiversity are those that are managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. We have a lot um, to learn, and indigenous peoples must not only be consulted, they must be uh, in a leadership role uh, as we go forward. Fourthly, we need to, and it relates to the ownership and the national level, we need to make sure that what we're doing here is part of the bigger picture. We um, 
it's stated in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, this is a contribution to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, to the UN Decade of Action. We know we are woefully off track at the halfway point towards the SDGs. Uh, certainly, we, we also know that without success uh, on biodiversity, we cannot achieve the SDGs. But also, without progress on gender uh, equity, without progress on equality, reducing inequalities, um, without process, um, progress on health and education, we know that we won't be able to achieve the biodiversity goals either. These are, these are interrelated. And we need to make sure that the work we're doing on monitoring um, is well integrated with the broader uh, uh, approach under the SDGs and we're working with national statisticians. Um, and finally, um, we do need to work towards building a real um, global biodiversity observation system. Uh, I was very pleased to see the paper that was um, published a few uh, days or a few weeks ago uh, by a number of you here. I'm sure we're going to hear more about this approach from uh, other, other speakers. Um, currently, we are patching together uh, pieces of data from this UN agency there, that NGO uh, uh, there, um, this national body here. We need to be able to really work towards integrating uh, and developing a, a, a serious monitoring system that is funded. And I, I recognize the challenge here, and we need to be calling for the, the funding not, not short-term project funding, but ongoing funding that can uh, support a proper um, uh, and broad uh, uh, biodiversity observation system. I'm sure that in the um, next few hours and days that you're all going to have lots of ideas on, on how we can do this. I really very much um, look forward to how you address this, this grand challenge. Um, it's going to be an important part of the picture in maintain, maintaining momentum, in um, ensuring that we can, this time, achieve the goals and targets that governments and uh, the world community has set uh, just a few months ago here in Montreal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Cooper. And now we are down to the Geobon co-chairs. And we will start with Maria Cecilia Londonio, who's a senior researcher at Instituto um, Alexander von Humboldt in Bogota, Colombia. Her main experience is on the use on, of biodiversity geographic analysis for decision making. Uh, she's working on the production of biodiversity indicators that you will be hearing about throughout this week, indicators and indicators. Uh, and she's also involved in development of web platforms for biodiversity data dissemination. And to save time, Maria, please. Thank you, Adriana. Um, Mr. Odi Sangora, uh, Mr. DeLorio, Mr. Morales, Mrs. Muguer, Mr. Cooper, dear participants to this Geobond Conference Monitoring Biodiversity for Action. Last time that we met was in Geobond Open Science Conference Annual Hands Meeting in July 2020 in a 100% virtual meeting. It makes me really happy today uh, that we are meeting in person again and I'm glad to see so familiar, so many familiar faces and so many new ones uh, that bring fresh ideas and points of views to this community. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate us all for the work we have been done over the past three years, for the work that each one of you and your research groups have done individually to learn more about the biodiversity of this planet but above all, I would like to congratulate us all for the collective work we have done 
stepping out of our comfort zones of scientific discussions and entering into political negotiations, resulting on an impact on national and multilateral biodiversity agreements. It's not easy, it's not easy to be a Latin woman in a leadership position, and I'm very great, grateful for the trust you have placed in me to do this work. I must confess that sometimes I wonder if, if I'm just the quota of representation of gender and developing countries in the network, <laughs> but seeing the results of the work done reassures me that we are fulfill, fulfilling our responsibility to move towards the strengthening of biodiversity observations, taking into account diverse views and differential conditions. Today, we can say that GeoBond Network provides fundamental support to the negotiation process of the global biodiversity framework, always highlighting the importance of having open science, particular data models and indicators that facilitate the planning and monitoring of the commitments acquired by the different countries. And that this support was always given with the countries in mind as their main users of biodiversity observation, mediating and understanding their economical, social, and political differences. I know that as an academic community, it's easier to see the glass half empty because our minds are trained for critical thinking. And it's easy for us to find more weakness than strength in the results of political negotiations. But I invite you to see in this new agreement an exceptional achievement. Having a decision where the countries commit to systematically report progress towards the goals and targets is a big step that we did not have before, and it's a great opportunity for Geobon. I know that changes in political systems are beyond our research and our reach, but as an academic community, we must continue to advocate for changes that is strengthened biodiversity observation systems. A first step is the Cumming Montreal Monitoring Framework Agreement. Maintaining a network based on volunteer work is not easy, so I deeply appreciate the dedication and time that each one of you has invested in Geobon. Because beyond all the systems and technological developments that we could have, the most valuable thing are the bonds that are created between people. The Geobon network and this conference is a space for co-construction. Let's take advantage of it um, and learn from each other, sharing our knowledge and creating partnerships to continue working for biodiversity. I will close this welcome by quoting a phrase from an article led by Carolina Ocampo Arias. Mm, I open parenthesis. It is a responsibility of ecology and conservation leaders of the global south to promote a scientific community that is representative of the vast demographic diversity and point of views that exist at the national and regional level. We call on Global South researchers to take charge of additional diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and shape the way that equity and inclusion is discussed at global scale. Our research and the conservation of tropical biodiversity can only benefit from this. I close parenthesis. Therefore, I would like to thank the effort it meant to be here today, in particular for the people of the Global South. Time, cost, visas. Let us all benefit from the diversity that this conference offers us, and I wish you a many, many rich discussions leading to the improvement of biodiversity observation systems. Thank you. Gracias, Maria. Thank you. Thank you for being a woman in science. Thank you for being a strong voice for the Global South. We do need people like you, and we are very grateful to have you as a Geobon co-chair. And now we have the other Geobon co-chair, Andrew Gonzalez, who will have a presentation. 
and is professor at McGill University where we are based, the Geobond Secretariat. He obtained his PhD in ecology from Imperial College London. He spent years as assistant professor uh, in Paris, Université de Paris, before moving to McGill 20 years ago. Another big celebration. Now he holds a Liber Aero Chair in Conservation Biology at McGill, and he's also the founding director of the Quebec Center for Biodiversity Science, and he's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Andy. Let's get this right. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour, bon matin, bienvenue. It's, the view from here is amazing. Uh, it's wonderful to welcome you all to Montreal, uh, to see so many friends, colleagues, and collaborators who I've seen essentially only by Zoom over the last three years. Um, I want to extend our warmest thanks to Elder Charlie Patton for that reminder of the creation story. I want to thank uh, Mark Diorio, uh, Ambassador Morales, Marie, uh, Madame Moger, David Cooper, and of course, Maria Cecilia, for all of the words of support uh, and of course, the welcome that you've given to, to all the participants of the Geobon Conference. The Geobon is absolutely about partnership. It's about collaboration and doing more with what we have at the full range of scales at which we understand um, biodiversity to be changing, but of course that society depends absolutely on the state of our biosphere. And so it wouldn't have been possible to bring the Secretariat of Geobon to Montreal without the support of the federal and the provincial governments of the city of Montreal. Um, and thank you to Montreal International for brokering that agreement. And of course I want to thank the chief scientist and our provincial funding agency and to McGill University for hosting uh, the Geobon Secretariat. It, talk about a whole of society approach. It really has been all hands to the pump to, to bring uh, this conference together. And of course, the funding and the support we've had over the years has allowed us to hire an extraordinary secretariat team who've worked tirelessly to make this event happen and to bring us all together. And that is surely the most important part of this conference is to bring us all together. So I want to take a, uh, just 10 more minutes of your time to maybe uh, provide a few thoughts and directions of how we see Geobon working with the global community and working towards uh, the, to the operationalization and the implementation of the Kunming uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And it was about pregnant pause. It was about 10 months ago that many of us were here in this room were supporting the negotiations uh, of the, 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 the framework, but also um, part of the realization that um, it had to go beyond the science, that what we were seeing on the page, that the words on the page were about a fundamental transformation of society, about mainstreaming biodiversity knowledge and a whole of society approach to taking on board the importance of biodiversity into our decisions uh, across every sector of society, in economy, uh, in, in different sectors of civil society. And so the, the realization of this framework uh, has been uh, critically important for driving science and innovation. And, and I think what we're starting to see right now are visions for the future, positive visions of what the world might look like. How can we achieve our uh, protected area targets by linking together protected areas so to ensure their integrity and their connectivity, to ensure that, that we're uh, meeting the representation and effectiveness of those protected areas? whilst not uh, leaving behind, in fact, fully acknowledging the essential value of the knowledge and the rights of, of indigenous people and local communities. But how will we know if we're going to make progress? That is the role of the KMGBF's monitoring framework. All right? This is the decision within the decision, the document within the document that's about steering and guiding uh, the countries to report on their action and progress towards the targets uh, and the goals of the KMGBF. 
And if we do that well, if we support countries in their needs, then we're going to be able to do the global reporting, the global stock take that will give us a sense of how we're doing. And of course, each country here represented by these spokes coming out of the wheel will make progress at their own pace. We can't expect a homogeneous uh, uh, pace of contribution and progress. That countries will do what they can over the decades of time. It, what we need to see is a, a concerted collective effort to reaching the goals and reaching the vision by 2050. Geobon was invited uh, by the parties at COP15 to contribute to not only the realization of the monitoring framework, but to supporting the implementation of uh, biodiversity observation networks and the monitoring systems we need to collect more data. Geobon's members are particularly focused, of course, on the targets of goal A and goal B, on, on the state of nature, on the state of biodiversity, and the many ecosystem benefits we get from that biodiversity. Geobon has been ready for about a decade now to, to respond to this call. Um, we're known for developing the essential biodiversity variables, and most, particularly, and most recently, the essential ecosystem service variables. The EBVs you see on the left are the fundamental descriptors of biodiversity across the hierarchical levels of life, from genetic to the composition of species and communities and the functioning uh, of ecosystems. But we can't just settle with descriptions of the changing state of nature. We have to connect that to the natural and anthropogenic drivers of biodiversity change, understanding the causes of change, and forming this detection and attribution framework that allow us to, to inform models and guide anticipatory and proactive policy and conservation action. So this is the next step for our network, is to develop the synthesis of knowledge so that we can better guide action. But our action and, and the value of the EBVs and the ESVs are only as good as the data that goes into them, the raw observations, the descriptions of nature. What I want to show you here is, a, is one impression of the incredible accumulation of observations. Billions of observations are now available in uh, global repositories and data sets like GBIF and OBIS and GenBank and literature data sets like those of PREDICTS uh, or BioTime that are augmenting our understanding of how biodiversity is changing. Here you're going to see a time lapse of the occurrence of observations, billions of observations in GBIF from 1980 to the present day. And as this plays, you're going to see a greening of the Earth's surface, a greening that is due to the accumulation of the observations of, 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 of individuals, of species in our ecosystem. And you'll notice, you don't need statistics to, to realize that, that it's a patchy knowledge, that we have much more information in the global north, in northwestern Europe and in the US and in Canada. We, we are uh, lucky to have access to so much information. So we must do much, much more to fill the gaps, the geographic gaps, the taxonomic gaps, the disparities among nations in access to this kind of information. And this is what Geobond's charge is about. And so what we are proposing in the new strategic plan of Geobond is to build a global biodiversity observing system designed to unite monitoring at all scales, from the local community up to the nation state and amongst the entire regions interacting, uh, interactions among countries. And we must do that in a way that has, uh, supports action, supports the end user in their need for that knowledge. So how do we do that? Well, over the last 10 years, Geobon has developed the guidelines for establishing what we call a biodiversity observation network, for linking up the communities of practice that are observing nature, that are living on the land, on the waters, and have a fundamental relationship to how biodiversity is changing. Geobon has proposed guidelines for the engagement, assessment, design, and implementation of a biodiversity observation network, no matter what the scale. And essentially it means that we have this backbone of observation sites that complement um, the observations made by citizens and by scientists, 
by the private sector across a territory at the scale of a country. And we combine different technologies to understand how the facets of biodiversity are changing. And we bring together a knowledge service. That is what a bond is about. Think of it a little bit like a meteorological service, but where we're not worrying about temperature and precipitation, we're worrying about the ebb and flow and the coming and going and the movements of species and the functioning of ecosystems. And it's this knowledge surface that allows us to collect data, curate it, drive the analytics and the models that we need to understand change, and to communicate the value of that information to society at large. That's great, but the magic comes when we foster the cooperation and coordination of bonds together to create a network of bonds, a network of networks, which is much more than the sum of its national parts. Why will it be so? Because we will be sharing information. We'll be sharing our understanding of how biodiversity is changing, not just locally due to local causes, but also because of regional and global causes that, causes that are interacting in any given place and time. And once we've created and assembled this global biodiversity observing system, we'll be in a position to frequently update our understanding of change from the global to the regional and down to the local scale and back up again. It's these cascades of learning and knowledge that allow us to guide conservation action. And so I want to close with uh, this, this key, I think, conclusion that right now we, are, we have a major gap in our science policy framework, that our climate colleagues have benefited from multiple global observing systems of climate, of weather, of the ocean, that have allowed them to work interactively with the IPCC and to um, inform countries about their progress. We're missing this. This is a fundamental piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we lack, and we need to establish this. This is a community working with our partners to establish GBIOS to fill this gap. And so, what can GBIOS do for us? I don't want to be overly prescriptive. I think these are the conversations that have to happen in the coffee breaks and the lunches and the dinners over the glasses of uh, wine and the cups of coffee. But I want to just sow a few ideas to stimulate conversation here. I think that by 2030, GBIOS can deliver essential observations needed to monitor the KMGBF, to mainstream monitoring science, knowledge, and data services, be a vehicle for enhancing the capability of new technologies, responding to policy needs to enable resilient social ecological systems, and finally, and perhaps probably the most importantly, train a new generation of biodiversity monitoring scientists that are going to carry this forward into the coming decades. And so I close with a call to let this conference galvanize our work together. Can we come together to form the collaborations and the commitments to each other to rationalizing our effort, to focusing our energies, to pulling off something as grand, a global public commons or good, than the form of a global biodiversity observation system. I'm confident that this network can do it. Let's go on and do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, of course, you've heard he mentioned GBIOS as, as a major part of our strategic plan. And our strategic plan, the last edits were done at midnight, and hopefully it will be online by the time we meet at the reception tonight. 